going to explain about the second project. Uh, no, this is sixth project. But I think you guys probably chose for, for the first project of the semester. And there, there is a slide um, on my on our Notion site, so you can you can download the PDF while we are discussing about the project. So let's see. So it's a six point three. So please understand there's some uh, difference between the title here. So my project is about neural network, but basically what we are going to do is an image training. And <clears throat> I'll tell you the objective first, and then we'll discuss about the content. So the objective of this project is implement a neural network, um, convolutionary neural network if you want, or you can use other neural network in order to train an image data, it doesn't have to be the same data t that I used in the slide. You can, there are many data sets that you can download for free. And one of the constraint is you cannot use, you don't, you shouldn't use the, this, whatever, the deep learning package. So only using the NumPy package and maybe matplotlib package, you should implement, you should make your own neural network model and then train your data set and then test your data, test your neural network model, whether it does whatever it should do well. Okay, so this is the neural network and let's, so there are some concepts that we didn't cover yet, although we're going to cover it maybe next week. So it's about the gradient. So, so far we only discussed about single variable function, but when we start discussing about the two variable function or three variable function, then you have a notion of partial derivative. And if you take your partial derivative as a component of a vector, that's called the gradient. So let me give you the definition first and then. So here, so when you have a two variable function, so it's a real valued function, but takes the two real number as an input, then your gradient at each point Let's say I want to take the gradient at x0, y0, then it's a two-dimensional vector whose components are partial derivatives at x and y. So what is a partial derivative? It's a rate of change of function in direction of x and y. So these are numbers, okay? These are numbers. So, and these are specific vector. It's not a vector field, it's a vector. So when you take a point at, at a certain point in two dimensional plane, and you want to compute the gradient, then you mean you want to take, that means you want to take actual two dimensional vector, which directs with a, which directs certain direction with a certain size. So there are several meaning of gradient. Uh, we're gonna discuss lots of meanings on the gradient, but one of the meaning of gradient, we skip a lot of things. You have to remember that, you have to understand that we skip lots of things here. But at the end, we're going to discuss about the meaning of gradient, which gives you a direction where the function changes its value the fastest. So actually, the function change as function increases the fastest when you move your point in the direction of the gradient. So that's the meaning of the gradient. Okay. So 
If you take the opposite direction of gradient, that means the function decreases the fast. So that's the essence of any artificial or deep learning mechanism. Because it, what you want is you want to minimize certain function so that if the function is minimized, that's the optimal state that you want to optimize whatever your task is so that your model works the best. So here we're taking f to be a function that should be optimized. Most of the times it's given by a loss function, which means that it's an estimate of error so that you want to decrease the error as much as you want so that you get uh, accurate result as possible. So Uh, well, you can read on your own. We're gonna discuss about the gradient descent. So, gradient descent is basic algorithm that makes that finds a point that finds a point where your loss function is minimized. So, let's take this example first. So, we're going to uh, find the best fitting line for the given data. So let's say given data, the data is given by two-dimensional point. So what each coordinate means is that x, fit, x coordinate of the data is the input and y coordinate of the data is an output. So let's say you're taking an experiment, like a one-dimensional experiment. You put an input of xi and you get the result of yi. Here, the index i is the number of your experiment. So at the first experiment, you put in the number xi and you got the result of yi by measuring the, the device, whatever the device is. So you got all this data and then after all, let's say I want to find out the model that governs the output data or the given input data. So our assumption is that I, I'm assuming that this x and y data are linearly related. So y is given by a linear equation of x, but I don't know what the slope and why the y intercepts are. So I want to find the slope and y intercept. So that's mu and rho, okay? So what's the loss function? What's the error? What's the function value that I want to minimize? I want to minimize the error between actual measured data and the ideal number. So ideally, it should be given by xi mu plus rho. But because of the error or the measurement error, uh, we got yi. So this is actual, uh, it depends on what actual means, but so this is actual, meaning that it's the actual value that you measured, and this is the, uh, what is it called, let's say ideal here. So ideal value and actual value. So there are error between these two values. I want this error to be minimized so that I can get as accurate number for mu and rho as possible. So I take the difference, so these are difference, that's an error. But if I just take the difference, considering it minus and plus, then some errors are canceled each other so that I don't get the actual amount of error. So that's why I should take the square. Um, you might think that you might want to take the absolute value of the error, but then it's hard to take the derivative. So it's not going to be the differential function, the differentiable function. So that's why we're taking a square here. So this is going to be the loss function. So what most people confused about is that loss function is a function of mu and rho, okay? X and Y are data that is given. So you can consider these X and Y as a constant. They're not moving, they're not changing. It's not that X and Y you're changing. You're changing the mu and rho so that your loss function gets the uh, minimum. So we are going to talk, we are going to express this loss function in terms of mu and rho. So you can see these 
all of these cons uh, in, for, in, in terms of X, Xi and Yr, these are constant, okay? These are fixed because theta is fixed. But what's not known is this mu and rho. So you can see this equation is a second degree polynomial of u, mu, and rho. It's a two variable function. Okay, so it's long, but it's just a simple two variable function. So I'm going to uh, substitute this constant into a to e, and then you can see that the simpler form of two uh, degree two polynomial. And let's take the gradient. Now, remember that the gradient, the function here, the two variable function is a function of mu and rho, okay? not x and y. So I'm going to take the partial derivative on mu, that's here, this one, because when I take the partial derivative, so here we skip lots of things here, but uh, easy way to remember how to take the derivative, partial derivative is that consider the variable that you're taking partial derivative as unknown variable and take the rest of all the other variable as a constant. So when I take the partial derivative by mu variable, then I'm taking rho as a constant variable. So constant, when I take the derivative, disappears. So you can take uh, this one disappears when I take the mu derivative. This one survives, so that goes here. And here, c is constant, but rho is also considered as a constant when I take the derivative in terms of mu, so that disappears. So here, now, rho is considered to be a constant. So here, this is just the same as the degree one polynomial of mu. So I can get this 2d mu uh, rho here, and then this becomes here, and this is the constant. So that's why I get this uh, formula for L mu, and same for this L rho. Okay, so these, this is the gradient. So here, the gradient is given as a formula of mu and rho because what I don't know what mu and rho, uh, I don't have the specific number for mu and rho, so we just took it as a, a formula. But what we want is we're going to put the number in. So each time I'm going to update my mu and rho in direction of minus of gradient, okay? Because minus gradient is the direction where the function here, the loss function, decreases the fastest, right? But if I take the gradient itself and I'm trying to change the, the value, then I might go too far because the gradient might be big. So that if I just take the gradient itself, then I might change my mu and rho too much so that I don't get to the minimum slowly. So I want to get minimum slowly so that I can get past the minimum. So I need to multiply some factor here. So step size in the neural network, it's called a step size. So I need, so uh, there's no rule, the, num the size of the step size, but you have to figure out by uh, try and error. So here, here are actual data that I am um, tested. So I started my mu and rho from 2.9 and 2.9. So by the way, did I put the numbers in? So uh, I don't have it, but so the data, they, I think the data was somewhere. No, there's no data, sorry for that. So, so if you plot the input data, xi and yi, you can see that there are uh, lined up in the direction of somewhere between, uh, somewhere near one slope of one and the y-intercept of one. But I don't know what the mu and rho are in the beginning, so I just randomly chosen here. So I just put 2.9 and 2.9 so that I can see, uh, show the, 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 the change of mu and rho dramatically. So that's why I just picked the 2.9 here. And then when I compute the gradient at that point, you can see that the gradients, the components of gradient are very big numbers. So I cannot just subtract this direct direction to the, the mu comma rho, which is 2.9. So I have to multiply h. So I took, I think I took the 0 0.01 uh, 
for the step size and then I update my uh, mu and rho. So the next mu and rho I get is this. So and then if I take this point, this second point, and then compute the gradient, you can see that the gradient is decreased. The size of gradient is decreased. So when you get to the minimum, the gradient becomes zero vector because there's nowhere to go because that's the minimum. Okay? And you can see that this, uh, uh, when I progress is this direction, then you can see that the gradient size of the gradient vector is getting smaller and smaller. So this is only 10 steps. So if I do it 100 steps, then the gradient become almost zero vectors. So you don't see any changes in the value of mu and rho. You can actually see that there's no, not many changes, uh, even at the ninth and tenth step here. So let's talk about how we can implement that in new image process, image uh, recognition. So I'm giving you the example of MNIST data set. Probably you guys know already. So this is the image that consists of 60,000 handwritten digits. So it's from 0 to 9. And uh, images are 28 by 28 size. And it's black and white. So each pixel are numbered with 0 to 255. So uh, although it's sorted in nine, 0 to 9, we are going to use only two types of numbers, 0 and 1, for simplicity. So you can uh, generalize in your task uh, so that the, the neural network can sort out all the digits. But here, we are going to use only 0 and 1. So if you try to search for the, the neuro, what's neural network, you can see lots of pictures and lots of words and so on. But I'm going to, so our purpose of doing this project is not about being an expert. We are going to understand the core idea of, the, uh, of this neural network or in a broader sense, the, the deep learning. So the basic of basic is, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to write it here. I just want a function that maps each image to either zero or one. That's, that's what I want. So if image is inputted, I want to sort out or label this image to either 0 or 1. I want that function. So if you think about the definition of function as in a broader sense, this function maps an image, which is an abstract object, to the two element, either 0 or 1. Now, let's be more specific. So in our data set, images are 28 by 28 pixel. So each pixel consists of a number. So there are 784 numbers from 0 to 255. So it's a number anyway. So I can, I can consider my each, I can consider each image to be a real number. I mean, as a, the 284 real numbers. So I want to map my image as a point in this big space. So it's a 284, right? 84 dimensional space. And I want it mapped to 0 or 1, but 0 and 1 are also real numbers, so I can map it to the one dimensional space. This is the function I want. So if I want this function now, I want to be as simplest as possible. What's the simplest function I can get in this case? What's, our, what's the simplest function that maps 784 dimensional space to the real number, one dimensional real number? It's either constant function or linear function. These are two simplest functions. If I take the constant function, that means every image is labeled as 
zero or one, but that only gives you 50-50 chances. That's not a good model. So I need to use the linear function. So I'm going to, so I'm, I think I have, a, I have it here. So I'm going to uh, uh, write my function f as f as a linear function. So I'm going to take this as my image. This is my image. So from now on, image is a vector. Vectors of numbers. Okay, image is in this case, it's a seventy seven hundred eighty four dimensional vector. So I need coefficient 784, actually one more than that, coefficient w's here, and then b1. So these coefficients are what defines my linear function, w1 to w784 and b1. So if I get these numbers correct, then I can choose any MNIST data, eight, the image data, and put it into the function in the place of x1 to x784, and then whatever comes out will turn out to be uh, some number that labels 0 or 1. So the problem is, here are two, two problems. Uh, actually, okay, so first problem is that um, if I use this value, then it's going to be a real number, right? Doesn't ha always have to be zero or one. And most of the times, the numbers of the function value will fall into the range outside zero and one, right? Most of the time. So just considering that the images are just a random image, if you put that x1 to x7784 in this formula, then you can see that this is linear, so this value, the, 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 the range, the, uh, the distribution of the function values will be uh, equally distributed in the, in, in the range, a big range of minus two plus, okay? So, but that's not good. I want to be, I, I want certain number that I can say, oh, th this is the zero image, this is the image of one. So. What I need is I need to translate this number from big minus to big plus into somewhere in the range of zero and one. So that's why I need sigmoid function. So this sigmoid function sigma maps every real number into the range of zero and one. So you can draw the image, draw the graph of this sigmoid like this. So here, when x goes to positive infinity, the sigmoid function approaches to 1. And if it goes to negative infinity, it approaches to 0. So every value that you computed as a linear function, linear equation, will be put it into the sigmoid function so that it lies between 0 and 1. Now, it's still not 0 or 1, but once we get the range from zero to one, then you can label the image as zero if the sigmoid value is less than 0.5. So this is image zero. And if it falls into the range of 0.5 to one, then you can label your image as one, okay? So that's all. That's basically everything. So the core, the meaning, and also one more, one, one, okay, so that's, that's basically the idea. And then now, um, how the problem, second problem is, how do I know such variable W and B? I cannot just uh, randomly choose this W and B and then test out whether, the, whether this values correctly uh, labels the image because there are too much. There are 784 variables there. You see, that's only for that. That's that's only when you have 28 by 28 size image. If the image size is a lot bigger, then you have tremendously large number of variables to figure out what that is. So 
in order to get these values as accurate as possible, you need to find your loss function. So the loss function here is similar to loss function in the linear regression. So you take now the function, the function is first translate uh, here. So here, this is T, sorry. So you first linearly transform your image by linear equation and then you put that into sigmoid function that's your that's your the function that that's the function that you're going to use to label the image now you have to fi figure out how accurate is your labeling so you're going to take your actual value so that's an actual and this is the real label, the correct label. And then you subtract each other. So y, y here is either 0 or 1 because it's labeled. We are using the image of 0 and 1. So you're subtracting your number between 0 and 1 to actual number 0 or 1. Okay? So, and then you take the square because I don't. If there could be a negative so I don't want the negative to be cancelled with the positive. So that I get the square. So that's your loss function. Now, where is the input data? The input data is hidden. Input data is already uh, considered in the formula of fun f here, or t here. Okay? So input data, if the input data is given, then you can always find what the loss function is given the weights w and b. Here. So by the way, the weight, the W here is called the weight, and B is called the bias. Now, how do we use this loss function to figure out the accurate value of weight and bias? So now you get used the chain rule. So now it's another topic that we have to discuss uh, sooner or later. I think maybe week after this next week so here let's decompose this uh, loss function into three pieces so first piece is that you take your weights and bias to get a certain value by the linear formula that's going to be called u uh, u and then you put that value u into the sigmoid function to get the value z and then you're putting that z value into the loss function or the square sum or whatever in so that you get the loss loss function value of loss function i want to find out the gradient of loss function that's our objective i want to find the gradient of loss function i want it to be in terms of w and b so that i can update in which direction should I change my W and B? Okay, so think about, so if you don't understand any concept here, let me know, uh, because this is the basic, or this is the basic and also the most important part. So the gradient must be in terms of W and B, because that gives you the direction where I should change my W and B. So in principle, when I take the gradient of L, that's the W of and B. It's a function of W and B, but I just abbreviated 784 W values in this W vector symbol. So basically it's going to be 785 dimensional vector, right? So it consists of L, W1 up to L, W784 and LB. So each component gives you the amount of change that I should make in order to make a loss function as minimum, uh, smaller than before, right? So, however, I cannot do it uh, altogether because it's, the functions are very complicated. So I split it into three pieces. So, and then let's try to think about the uh, loss function first in terms of z. Okay, so because we start from the last one, the last formula here. So, if I just 
forget about the formula of z, although z is a function of u and u is a function of w, but let's forget about this formula of z. It's just function of z. It's a one single variable function. So if I take the gradient, uh, it's going to be one dimensional function. So it's actually a function, one dimensional vector. So it's actually a real number. But if I take the gradient, it's just taking a derivative of z minus y squared, right? So it's in terms of z. Okay. So what happened? So well, y is considered as constant, as I said. So it's going to be two times z minus y times the derivative of z minus y, which is 1. But here, since I don't want to lose the information that this is the direction of z, z axis, so I put this symbol here, which I'm going to explain what this means in after, uh, later, later in the class. Um, so this basically means that it's uh, that direction. OK, so it means I need to move my z value uh, to the direction of, to the z direction, which is, oh, there is only one direction to the z direction, by this much, 2 times z minus y, in order to get smaller loss value than before. Now, wh which direction is the z direction? Now, I have to figure out, I have to rewrite my z direction in terms of u. So let's try to go to the second equation. z is a function of u, so I'm going to take a derivative of z function in terms of u. So if I do that, so sigma u is 1 plus x pub u 1. You simply take the single der derivative of single variable function because this is just a single variable function. So that's what you get here. And think about this carefully. So if you take this as a product of 1 over 1 plus e to the minus e times minus e to the u, e1 plus e to the minus u, then what is this? This is just z, right? So z is given as a sigmoid function. That's z, okay? And what about this? This is 1 minus z, okay? So that's why we have here. So what does it say? So when you want to move your z coordinate by unit distance, then you have to move your y value to the y direction by this much, z minus 1 minus z. Okay? So we didn't get to the end, but let's, let, let's check what we have done so far. I want to make my loss function smaller than before. It's this first derivative, first gradient says, uh, in order to make my loss function smaller, I need to move my z coordinate in direction of z axis by this much. And in order to move my z coordinate, then I need to move my y coordinate this much. Okay? So now, how do I, uh, uh, how should I change my w and b in order to move my u variable? So this comes here. So u is, as I said, t w b. So as I said, it's uh, x1 w1 up to x784 w784 plus b. So now u is a multivariable function. When if you if I want to move my u in direction of u direction u axis, then I have to move my w1 to w784 and b this much because I take so this is another chain rule, but you can think of this as a uh, gradient too because if you want to take the if when you take the gradient of u, then what you what you want to get is take the partial derivative of these formula, this uh, linear formula, in terms of w1 to w784 and b. So you get this 785 dimensional vector. So each is each, this symbol, the partial symbol, gives you the coordinate 
of this 885 dimensional vectors. So now let's talk about each component. So what does yi component says? So yi component is there somewhere in here xi times delta wi here. So I, it says I need to move my wi variable uh, by xi much in order to move my u variable. Okay, so let's trace back how I should do what I should do to uh, what, what, what this changing of u does. So in order to change the u, uh, the change of u gives the change of z this much, and change of z gives you change of l this much, right? So now you can fully write the amount of change that your wi component must have in order to move it in direction of the gradient l. This is how much you should move in direction of wi. So how about b component? b is just one, so you don't have xi here, so it's simply this. So each time, so this is after each uh, iteration, in order to minimize your loss function, in order to minimize your loss function, you should you move your wi component by this much, this this much, and then you you have to update your bias variable b by this much. Again, uh, this is the raw data. This is this is the raw component of your gradient. You don't want to use the raw gradient because it might be too big compared to the size of actual size of w i and b. So you have to multiply step size h in order to make uh, in order to make a small update each time. What the difference between the linear regression and this case is that x i is now changing. So x i represent the ice pixel in single image. Okay? If you have a single image, then this is over. But that's not going to give you the good result because you want to train your model as much as possible so that whenever you get the new input, you want output to be correct. Right? So there are, as I said, uh, total 60,000 counting from 0 to 9. So if you take 0 and 1 image, then there are about 12,000 images. So you want to train these 12,000 images into the model so that you get the correct W and B. If you take these 12,000 images all together, then it's going to be 700 84 times 12,000, which be becomes too big, like how many? 4 million or something. So you, know, you don't want to do that. You don't want to put every images in 12,000 into one big, one big model. You want to split each images to train uh, separately. So there are many ways to train uh, if effect efficiently. So if you one one easy or stupid way is just train image one by one but that might not be a best uh, or most efficient way because uh, if you train it say if you if you train an image or input which best fit to the classification then it will start off good it's, it's, it will it will have a good start, but if you train, if, if you happen to pick the images that are very bad example to be classified, then it will have a rough start. So uh, training image one by one is not a good way. So the people th thinking about the batch size so that they're collecting uh, like hundreds of image as a group so that you take the group of images and you take the loss function and you uh, average out the loss function and you're trying to update your W and B. And then you take the batch size of hundred of groups, groups of hundreds randomly, and then you do it over and over uh, so that eventually 
uh, it sweeps all the images, but still uh, uh, you don't have a biased result because of the choice of the uh, because of the choice of the images, and so and also uh, there's called the epoch says that you don't want to train it once. You don't want to train uh, once, but let's say you want to train the same set of data like over and over so that your accuracy goes up. So, but however, we don't we don't count that as I mean in this example we don't count that concepts at all. So I just trained images by images. So here I'll give you how you can load the data and then try uh, implement on, on your own. So uh, actually you have to use one packages, Keras, only for loading the data set. So in the Keras package a library, there has a lot of data set and the MNIST data is one of them. And you can load the data and then I uh, separate out the images that are labeled as zero or one. So the data set consists of image data and the label data. So they are ordered the same, the same way. So use the label data to sort out all the zeros and one images. And you can see that's very simple here. So I define my sigmoid and I define my size and step size. And I first initialized my weights and bias as a random number from zero to one and the size of 784. And then I just iterate over training images. So it's about 12,000 iteration. For each iteration, I take a label and I take the image and I flatten out as a one dimensional uh, 784 vector, dimensional vector. Um, but uh, as I said, this data set is consists of image whose pixel values are 0 to 255. So that's too big number. So I have to normalize it from 0 to 1. So I divide it by 255. Okay. So all the images are from, uh, the color values are from 0 to 1. And I define my y, which is the sigmoid value. And actually, this is going to be the uh, z here. So in our slide, I used the z variable in order to represent y. But anyway, uh, and the label uh, here is the y variable in the formula in the slide. So anyway, so, so this is going to be the amount of change that I should make to the direction of w, and this is the amount of change I should make to the b. So weight and bias are not the same sized factor. Bias is just a number. Weight is 284 dimensional vector. So dw is going to be a multi a multiple of constant numbers to the image size, which is 784 dimensional vector. So it's going to be the 784 dimensional vector. And db is just a number. So I'm going to update these numbers to the value weight and bias here every time I train each image. So that's all. So um, I didn't put the output, but before I train the image, the success rate, uh, success means that I labeled the image in the correct label, it was 55%, about 55%. But after training, it goes up by 99.9. .9. Only one training without batch size, without uh, any uh, one epoch. And this is the image that failed to label correctly. So this is, I think it's zero, but uh, it, the, the, the outcome of my model says it's one. Uh, that's why it turned out to be false. But see, this is why, you know, um, uh, this reasonable, it's it, the failure, failure, failing label this image uh, correctly is reasonable because this is not really looks like a correct zero, right? Or sometimes people, people could confuse too. So anyway, um, that's all. 
So what you uh, I didn't put the additional task. So what you're going to do as an additional task is uh, you can try to do labeling the 0 and 9 up to 9 without using any packages or deep learning packages. Just the same ideas here. But now you have to think about this a little bit uh, differently because when you label 0 or 1, we can use the single value uh, of label to classify this number. But if you use 10 number, 10 digits, then the label uh, is not going to be the number between 0 to 9 because you can see the sigmoid function is not linear. So it's not a good way to use this. It's not a good idea to use the sigmoid. But you can uh, consider labeling the image as a vector. So for example, if you're using the image 0, then the label is going to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Or if you're using the if you're labeling the image 1, then 0, 1, 0, 0, 0 is going to be the, the label of that image, and so on. So you're going to consider the function, a labeling function, as a function from r to the 784 dimension to r to the 10. So it's now going to be the multivariate function with the vector valued function. Or you can do another task. So this is not a cumulative, so this is not the task that you can do in all in a single in in one project. So you have to pick project. So you have to you can change your data set. So instead of using the digit, you can use the image of I think there is an image labeled as cat or dog in the Keras package library. So you can there are lots of images of cats and dogs and you can label them as cat or dog. Uh, and you can use that image data. Uh, oh, one more thing that you can use is that since we didn't use any of the hidden layer, you can try to implement the hidden layer. Um, if you understood, and if you understood what's going on here, if you understood what's going on here, then the now the hidden layer, whatever that explained in anywhere, it's not going to be that hard. So. You just need, you just add one more linear function as a composite of loss function, that's all. So if you have one more function to composite, then you have one more steps to figure out what the gradient direction is. So that's all. And then you can, so that's one more additional task you can do. And I think you can use the hidden layer to correctly, yeah, you have to use the hidden layer to classify the uh, cat or dog. Or you can use other figures, uh, other labeled images. For, for example, there are lots of images like, uh, like there's a images that are labeled in 10 different categories, including cars, trucks, like that. So you can use that as a data set. Or you can use, do something totally different if you, um, but, I, I, but I don't want you to deviate too much from the gradient descent. So as long as you can use the gradient descent algorithm and try to uh, and able to implement this idea and try and able to explain the mathematical backgrounds, then you can use any other model in, not bound to the neural network. So I want to take any questions if you have any. Yes. I'm not sure what is it. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to be 28 by 28. I think it's a bit bigger than that. Uh, you can rescale the image or you can change the size of image size so but if, if you just increase the image size then it's going to be it's a hundred let's say image is hundred by hundred if it take the multiple then it's already ten thousand right so it's going to be the function that la labeling function is ten thousand dimensional space to uh, 
one dimensional space. Now it's too big. So, and also it's not efficient and not going to work well but because here, uh, so you have to understand the work of what hidden layer does. So hidden layer, when you classify image, is going to um, going to make uh, what hidden layer does is make a small size, smaller si windows in, on the image, so that you put, for example, I want to take let's see, uh, five by uh, seven by seven window here. So I'm going to take a snapshot from the left right corner, left top corner to the right top corner until I get to the bottom here. So I get the snapshot of seven by seven pixels of each part of the image. And then I get the number, uh, I, I get the number from that seven by seven pixel sub image. Okay, so now I get the another, uh, and so that that gave that gives me the layer in between the original layer of image and the final the result. So the the layer in between is called the hidden layer. So the reason why we call it hidden is we don't know what's going on. But basic idea is that if I take the snapshot and get the characteristic of that small window or of each part of the image. So for example, if you see the zero or one, if you take the quadrant of these two images here, so you can imagine that if it's one, then if I take the uh, this quadrant, then there should be nothing here. Here or here, there should be something that goes across in order to become one. But in the image of zero, if I take the quadrant here, I might, I might expect to see something like a round shape going all, the, all across the four quadrant, then that characteristic is represented in the hidden layer values. So in the cat or dog situation, if you don't use the hidden layer, I also want to see what would happen if you can uh, if, if you if your task is to figure out what the hidden layer, uh, the, the 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 working of hidden layer, you can compare the result of the model with or without the hidden layer. But if you don't have a hidden layer, then it means that it's hard to catch the certain characteristic of the image of certain part. So, for example, if it's a cat, then you see, you can tell the difference between dog and cat by their ears, shape of ears, or shape of whatever, tail, or something like that. So, uh, and also, if you have a hidden layer, then uh, you have a smaller number to deal with each time. So, that gives you uh, better performance. So, performance-wise, good way to use a hidden layer. Also, the accuracy is the reason why we're using hidden layer. So any other questions? So I think the time is already past almost one. So if you have, if you have a class, then you can, you can dismiss. Or if you have any other question, let me know. And raise your hand if you're if you're raise your hand if you're use, if you're doing the neural network for the first project. Who's doing neural network for the first project? So almost everyone, except for a few. Okay. All right. So you can tell your group member uh, what the project is about or you try to explain here, then you can get a better understanding by explanation. I think...
Are you in section five? Section three. So uh what's your name? Kim Shi Hyung? I will be. Okay, you're you're in group three. Group of three. Okay, Imat, you can group with Imat. 